when we look at that diagram of the hands, we see, studying embryology, that these similar structures come from different parts of the embryo. We see, for example, in the newt, they come from segments 2 through 5. From the salamander, it comes from segments 6 through 9. And in man, it comes from segments 13 through 18. Totally different genetics producing these hand-like structures. And so De Beer says, no, there's no such thing as uh, homologous genes. He continues saying the attempt to find homologous genes has been given up as hopeless. But if that similarity is not genetic and doesn't come from common genes, then uh, we've got to look for another explanation. I think we have one. The evolutionary explanation begins to fade in, in this comparison, comparison. It's similar to the argument that we see in most of the textbooks today that began uh, over 100 years ago with Haeckel, who drew similarities of embryos. And in the upper portion of this picture, we see a variety of organisms, but obvious similarities in the earliest part of the embryonic stage. But as they develop, we see the fish and the, the salamander, the, the pig, uh, the chicken, the man, they began to look more different. But they began, they began very similar, and that proves this common origin, you see. And that argument was one of the most impressive, Darwin said, that he saw for his theory. And uh, it's been in textbooks ever since then. Though we knew better, Keith Thompson, president of the Academy of Sciences, acknowledged this. Uh, the theory is sometimes called ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny. You know, that's impressive sounding. That means is you started out in one form of the embryo and you went through the lizard stage and the chicken stage and on up through other stages. And that kind of an argument is used by uh, the abortionist to justify killing babies in the lizard stage because obviously that's all right. Keith Thompson says, surely the biogenetic law, referring to this ontogeny, recapitulates phylogeny, surely it's dead as a doornail. This was back in 88. But he says it was finally exercised from biology textbooks in the 50s. Well, maybe in the ones he's familiar with. They're still in the textbooks in Texas and throughout the country. It, as a topic of serious theoretical inquiry, it was extinct in the 20s. And we knew it from the 20s. Uh, Taken out of the textbooks, he says, in the 50s, here in uh, 1988, he says, why, well, nobody believes this anymore, but yes, they do. In fact, there was an expose done just uh, a couple of years ago here in the front page, on the front page of the London Illustrated News. Uh, we see Haeckel's drawings on top, but at the bottom, we see the actual photographs of the embryos that are supposed to look very similar, which do not at all. In fact, the headlines is uh, Haeckel was just an embryonic liar, and that is the case. Here, Research News and Science Magazine again shows similar pictures. The upper lineup here shows the actual picture. The lower lineup shows the supposed similarities as Haeckel drew it. Not at all like it was. And notice the headlines, Haeckel's embryos, fraud rediscovered. Well, they knew it back in the 20s. But now then, it's been rediscovered. It's been published on the headlines, the front page of the newspapers. It's here in Science. It's also in, in New Scientist. Quoting here from New Scientist, although Haeckel confessed and was convicted of fraud at the University of Guinea, the drawings persist. That's the real mystery, Richardson says. The drawings do persist. We look at the newest textbook in Texas, uh, this, uh, our students, uh, or actually the taxpayers, pay like $85 a copy for. Beautiful, elaborately illustrated textbook, and there are the drawings just like Haeckel drew them. Drew them the fraud, uh, the disgusting misrepresentation of evidence that we've known for a long time, but there it is, big as life, right there still in the textbooks. And the argument is similarities would indicate common genetic relationship. Well, even that's not so. As we've seen, there is at least another possibility. Common genetic uh, origin could explain similarities, but when we look at genetics, we see these similar parts come from different genetics. It could be explained by common designer. And so even if it were true, it doesn't prove the point, but it's not true. And being a fraud, it's still perpetrated on our school children. We see a similar argument uh, that at least was made uh, quite often in the past, and we still hear it from time to time today, involving numbers of chromosomes with the headlines of all the information with the 
the Human Genome Project, I've heard several references to how many chromosomes we have. And we look at this sequence and we see what looks like an evolutionary sequence. The human it has 46. And look here, penicillium only has two. And the opossums in the middle are about 22. That looks better. Uh, the alligator, 32. We can understand that. That looks like an evolutionary picture. But what you find, and this is true with all, many, many, many times when you're examining this evidence, that some of the evidence, when you only look, only look at part of it, can be interpreted to support evolution. But when you back up and get the whole picture, it looks very, very different. We look back at this chart where more information is included, and yes, man has 46, but tobacco has 48, the chimp has 48, the fern has 480. <laughs> Penicillium has two, uh, but look at the onion has 32, the poss opossum has 22. This is not an evolutionary picture it can be made to look like an evolutionary picture if you select the evidence and if you arrange the evidence and don't talk about the rest of it. I like to look at the whole picture. I like to uh, see who's doing the arranging and what assumptions are involved in the arrangement. I like to see all of the evidence. When you see all of it, it looks very different. Similar arguments are made by comparing the DNA of chimps to humans, and it's often pointed out there's only 1.6 percent difference in uh, in the DNA. It's very very similar, you see, and that uh, we don't know for sure is true. We haven't uh, completed the sequence of either chimp or human, uh, but there's some indirect inferences that would lead us to that conclusion. That's not uh, completely out of the question, but how much difference is 1.6 percent? when we're talking about three billion uh, nucleotides in the human genome. Well, 1.6% of three billion pieces of information is significant. How much difference can it make to have 1.6% difference? Well, let's think about it in terms, uh, well, we're talking about 48 million nucleotides there, 1.6%, that's a lot of nucleotides. And comparing that to cystic fibrosis, we see the the change that produces cystic fibrosis only involves a billionth of 1%. Not 1.6%, but 1 billionth of 1% of the genome, a difference of just 3, not 48 million. And when we consider sickle cell anemia, it's one-third of that. One-third of 1 billionth of 1% produces this phenomenon that is often fatal. Uh, we're talking about a difference of one nucleotide, and yet we're told that Oh, it's only 1.6 percent, 48 million nucleotides, and oh, surely you can do that. <laughs> now you see it looks very different. We find lots of similarities. Sometimes we don't completely understand because what we learn is that these uh, bits of information often do several things at once in different directions, and it takes combinations in order to produce the effects. Just changing one uh, doesn't necessarily affect only one thing. It may affect several things, and it takes quite a few to affect uh, the complete uh, feature, like an eye, for example. And then similarities like this are beginning to show up. Notice the statement here uh, from last year, the sheepish ancestors. <laughs> Sue Galloway, University of uh, Ontago, who led the team, included scientists at Helsinki University in Finland, was quoted as saying, sheep are human, basically. 98% of our genes are the same. Well... <laughs> Uh, and we have found that bacteria is about 90% the same. Uh, you have to not only have the, the same uh, sequence, but you have to have combinations that are doing the same thing, that turn on and off at the same time and, and work together in the same way. And by that means you see that similarities don't mean nearly as much in this area as we're often told. Uh, we become more like sheep. But let's look carefully at similarities, and what we see is they're selecting just some, like the case with the chromosomes. We look at some similarities, and we see obviously there's not an evolutionary relationship. If you think these fish look similar, then I've caught you because neither one of them are fish. One's a mammal and one's a reptile. 